Welcome everyone to the first Esoterica lecture or reading. I'm going to present Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. And I have here an edition of the text which is attached to the advancement of learning. But in the original publication, this unfinished work by Bacon, which was published posthumously, after his death in, I think, 1627, um, it was published, or 1626, just um, shortly after uh, his death, really. It was originally part of the Silva Silvarum, the Forest of Materials, which is also described by Bacon as a natural history in 10 centuries, the cover of which I might actually use here uh, as an image so that you have it um, in, uh, to ha so you have it to hand, but you can easily find it uh, yourself. It uh, quotes Genesis, at uh, vidit Deus lutsim quat as et bona, God judged the light having been seen was good on its cover. And attached to that, we find the fable of the new Atlantis. And what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to read um, this text in parts, and I'm also going to discuss a few things, and this will probably be two parts in total because it is quite long. Now, let's begin perhaps first with just um, the idea of Atlantis. Uh, Atlantis is... A myth, uh, in, in the modern sense of the word, genuinely a myth, but it could also be in a more profound sense of the word, be a myth, where we do understand that myths are actually more important uh, than recorded history. And so it's quite striking, don't you think, that Bacon, this, you know, uh, this epitome of early modernity, of the complete re reinvention of humanism and this revolt really against being and against nature that Bacon, amongst others, uh, expresses. Uh, didn't he say somewhere that nature needs to be tortured in order to, well, to get the results from her that we desire? It is precisely in the Novum Organum by Francis Bacon from 1620 that we find the demand for the vexation of nature, for torturing nature to get the results that we want, per vexationis artium. So by means of uh, experiments, we can uh, demand from nature the results that we desire. As we shall see, this is largely inspired by Bacon's peculiar study of the Bible and of King Solomon, but we'll get to this later. Now let me read to you from William Rawley's introduction to the first edition of the New Atlantis from 1627. Uh, Rawley was the uh, chaplain of Francis Bacon and also to uh, King Charles I and II. Now, um, when Bacon died, he was, uh, Raleigh was bequeathed um, Bacon's estate, and that included his unfinished manuscripts, one of them being New Atlantis. And I think that Raleigh really describes well what it is that Bacon intended with this work. So let me read from the edition that I have. This fable my lord devised to the end that he might exhibit therein a model or description of a college instituted for the interpreting of nature and the producing of great and marvelous works for the benefit of men under the name of Salomon's house or the college of the six days works. And even so far his lordship hath proceeded as to finish that part. Certainly the model is more vast and high than can possibly be imitated in all things, notwithstanding most things therein are within men's power to effect. 
his lordship thought also in this present fable to have composed a frame of laws or of the best stage or model of a commonwealth but foreseeing it would be a long work his desire of collecting the natural history diverted him which he preferred many degrees before it this work of new atlantis as much as concerned the english edition his lordship designed for this place in regard it hath so near affinity in one part of it with the preceding natural history so it has quite a bit of affinity raleigh tells us with the silver silvarum um, which is also just often you know you can think of it as a collection of uh, experiments and at the same time we can see here sort of the blueprint as it were for the royal academy and in fact based on this esoteric reading of genesis and of solomon who um, is a figure who had become prominent again in the more sort of uh, clandestine circles around england and other places in europe and but we can see here also that perhaps New Atlantis, of course, is a fable, but it is certainly not a fable of what's sometimes referred to as a magic realism. It is instead rather something else. So it doesn't add magical elements to what could really be, but instead it genuinely tries to speak something into existence. And that is for example what we would now today refer to as genetic modification of plants and of animals in fact as we shall see when we read the text in the new atlantis the inhabitants have perfected the art of knowing all causes and hence all effects of nature and thus being able to control nature entirely and completely for the ends of man so this is at the basis really of the british commonwealth this notion uh, of the british empire and and also uh, of the royal academy and as such is also uh, as a fable so-called a mythopoetic work that spake something into existence perhaps a few words now on atlantic to say the obvious the assumption behind the new humanism here of bacon is that the world is in need of repair the idea that creation is unfinished is something that you find again and again uh, prometheism for example assumes the same thing this is entirely foreign th this way of thinking uh, which comes in through to put it carefully uh, the old testament really uh, is in, this sort of thinking is entirely foreign to the Greco-Roman world. Uh, to assume that the world is in need of repair and that creation needs to be perfected is ultimately a foreign idea. And it is here, however, promoted by Francis Bacon. Um, so at once, of course, the assumption must be that the world is created and that as such that it can be known in its causes and effects but at the same time this creation is also imperfect and must hence be perfected according well to the ends of man now also note that causality by francis bacon is explicitly anti-aristotelian uh, not to say that uh, causus and i won't get into this here is uh, is in any way um, is, is already quite a misleading translation of the original uh, Greek. The Greek word is aition, which could be thought of as indebtedness or owing something to something else. I won't go into this here, but just know that already the think of cause is in some sense, a stifling of the original Aristotelian insight into the so-called four causes, the four idea. And if you remember, Aristotle tells us of 
four causes, the so-called material, or at least in Aristotelianism, let's say, there's ma the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. Now, Francis Bacon explicitly does away with the so-called final cause. That means to say he does away with the telos. Now, what remains with Bacon is the efficient cause. So that's to say that which causes a certain effect to a certain pre-desired goal. Don't conflate this though with a telos. The telos is the inherent end of something. So the ripening of a fruit in its specific and in its own time that is quite different from making a fruit as Bacon will explicitly say in the New Atlantis that they can let a fruit ripen in just about any time and without regards for the seasons. So that's the, that's the destruction of the telos and Bacon explicitly said that Aristotelianism had been an impediment to the development of the sciences. Now, I think I should also note just um, in passing that th this sort of empiricism that we find here is not much of an empiricism at all. It doesn't look at various cases and then just inductively finds a general rule. It's quite the opposite, actually. That's perhaps outwardly what it pretends to do. But as a matter of fact, what really happens is that certain results are desired and they are desired perhaps also through biblical influences and then nature is tortured towards achieving those ends it is not the case that we simply here observe nature and then make up our minds about what the laws might be behind it even then by the way you would no longer be an empiricist, you would already have stepped in the realm of metaphysics if you're looking at the laws behind. And sometimes I wonder if Richard Dawkins, now he's 80 some years old, if he ever wises up to that. I have uh, my suspicions that he won't, because as you can see, he's in his mindset quite close to a bacon still, and uh, perhaps without the biblical underpinnings, but ultimately it's the same modus operandi. There's not much um, thought going into it. It's rather about exercising control and being witty about it at the same time. Now, perhaps a few words on Atlantis. Atlantis is a mythical principle, let's say, to search for Atlantis and to try and find out where the city may have been is, again, a typical empiricistic um, move. Instead, what we need to understand is that Atlantis is, as it's been spoken into mythic actuality by Plato and others, it epitomizes and has come to epitomize also historically those attempts precisely at controlling perfectly and totally nature. And isn't it striking though that Bacon explicitly refers to Atlantis rather than let's say Athens knowing that Atlantis sank or that it was hit by earthquakes. Whatever it may be, that doesn't make much of a difference. Ultimately, it is a punishment of the gods. And in Plato's unfinished dialogue, Critias, or Critias, we find that implied quite heavily that the gods punish Atlantis, and hence Atlantis disappears. Atlantis is also presented by Plato as the arch nemesis of Athens. In Athens, Plato finds quite a different description for Athens than he does for Atlantis. In fact, the main difference is, as you can 
find in Plato's dialogue on on Atlantis and Athens and the Critias, which I think is the most important one, more important than the Timaeus, perhaps, is that Athens is founded on a different principle than Atlantis is. And this might also be a guiding thought for us today if we wish to overcome or get out of modernity and its bastard son post-modernity. So if we wish to overcome these you know, biblically underpinned sort of pseudo-esoteric weird uh, <laughs> Um, and, and by the way, isn't it isn't it quite striking that a hardcore empiricist, so called as Francis Bacon, turns to a fable? I think it's always quite striking that those thinkers who cannot actually think in terms of speculative reason, very quickly resort to language that is to do with magic. Now I'm looking around here, and I see a book by Richard Dawkins again, which is entitled The Magic of Reality. The Magic of Reality. Okay. Well, if it's magic, then it isn't necessarily reality, is it? In any event, what Bacon does when he resurrects Atlantis is that he resurrects the principle on which Atlantis is founded, and that is lack. It is a purely negative principle. Atlantis is founded not only on lack, but also on the clear opposition, or almost outright opposition to what the Greeks refer to as scolaire. And scolaire we could translate as leisure, which is a mistranslation. But we should rather think of scolaire as the measure of sufficiency, of peace, of measuredness and sufficiency, and also a sense of equilibrium, fullness, wealth, and richness at the heart of being. And it is precisely this principle that at Athens is founded on. Thanks very much for listening. This was the free preview. And the full lecture, which is about 50 minutes long, is available only to all paid subscribers. So if you'd like to listen to the rest of this lecture on Francis Bacon's New Atlantis and also to the second lecture, which will be coming out on this topic next month, then feel free to subscribe and support my work in this way. Thank you very much indeed.